Uh, my name is John Sykes. I'm the executive director of Magnolia Mound, which is a um, historic house museum and education center that's been on the National Register of Historic Places since about 1972. Um, it is the oldest documented structure in the city of Baton Rouge, but when it was built in 1791, it was not part of the city. Um, we've been an active education center with programs for kids and school kids since we opened our doors in 1975. I was inspired by other folks. Um, and um, so my great aunt was involved in saving uh, historic properties in my part of North Carolina and in the 60s. And so um, history and buildings kind of worked themselves together. And so that, that, that idea of a building being significant as a, a place that stood for a historical event was stuck in my head and my grandparents were big about going to see every brown historical marker on the interstate system you know we had to stop and see all of those and so those were big important things um i moved to baton rouge after graduate school and um, settled very early in spanish town and so that became my neighborhood and it's the oldest uh, historic district in the city it's the earliest surviving neighborhood in, in Baton Rouge. And so that was a place where I lived and I was um, uh, served on the first historic preservation commission when it was first started and our, after our first historic district ordinance um, and then ended up on that serving the neighborhood for a long time as the representative um, and then later chair of the commission. Um, so that that early part was uh, helpful because we learned uh, even with a very weak ordinance which we still have a very weak ordinance in the city of baton rouge that it does have power uh, to um, influence people to do the right things um, I went to school um, in uh, North Carolina at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, which had a really active historical society preservation group in that city and was familiar with their work. And then I went to, uh, after a little stint of, uh, of teaching abroad, I came back and went to graduate school in Tuscaloosa, Alabama for American history and was did a lot of work uh, researching um, historic uh, life on plantations during the Civil War, black and white relations, what were the communities like of enslaved persons and how they adapted to that pretty horrific situation, um, developing communities and maintaining family ties and those kinds of things were the focus that I did in graduate school. And I was very interested in the built community left over from the enslaved period. Um, what could those surviving structures tell us about how people lived? Um, and so that was my um, early part. And I, between graduate school and uh, um, uh, college, I'd had a brief stint where I was doing National Register nominations for buildings. And so um, I learned how that process worked and um, what that documentation was involved. and how you really get to learn about a structure and then you also place it based in the area and the context of how it uh, fits. And there's various criterion that the you know, Department of Interior have established for structures to be listed on the National Register. So each one of those are a little different. And so learning about that and how it makes a building important and worthy to be registered and learning about the integrity of a building, um, what makes it special, what parts need to be there, and what, if you change them, uh, will change all of that. It, a real, it was very helpful to learn. Um, the Secretary of Interior's standards, which are everybody kind of knows in the field, but I did not know until then, and, and you learn those and you understand what that means to a building's integrity and how it stays. So, uh, those were the things that were, were part of my background and 
in most recent years, probably the last past eight years or nine years, um, I've served as the uh, member of the National Register Review Committee, uh, which is the statewide commission that reviews all the National Register nominations from across the state of Louisiana. Um, this current year, I'm the chair of that committee. We meet three times a year. We review um, applications or nominations to the National Register. And um, then if we agree uh, and they meet all the criteria, we will, as a group, vote to send them on to um, the keeper of the register for approval at the federal level. Right. So I think one of the reasons that keeps me um, in the role of executive director at Magnolia Mound, this will be uh, moving towards, I guess, the start of my 10th year, is there is really no average day. So every day is totally different. Um, uh, it is uh, could be um, a programs in the morning with school kids, or it could be a, 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 vir a virtual lecture or a lecture at night. Um, I meet regularly with a, a very active support board, um, so I stay in contact with those uh, individuals. Um, I do a lot of work with the staff. We have a large staff here. Um, we have four full-time people and we have lots of part-time people that do tours and do education programs. Uh, we have support staff that maintain the buildings and the grounds. Um, so there are lots of meetings and lots of discussions about things. Uh, we tend to, uh, well, every process has a start and a beginning. Um, when we have uh, eight structures that are uh, historically significant, six of them are listed on the Rational Register here. So on site, there's always something that needs to be done. So there's um, you know, a facility plan. Okay, this year it's the uh, roof replacement here. It's going to be this, or we're going to do... Uh, a new collections plan, or we will do a new interpretive guide. Uh, we just recently completed a book uh, about the site and its collection. Um, we're working on expanding access to the enslaved family records we have here at Magnolia Mound. We don't have a great deal, but what little we have, we're trying to put uh, on as a web presence so people could at least see them and connect, possibly, uh, to the enslaved families who lived at Magnolia Mound. Uh, we're trying to expand programming too, and so that keeps us busy with working with um, outside um, contractors uh, who are doing specialty repairs on our historic buildings, or they're doing projects, research projects, um, uh, working. We're always, history and even running a historic site, it's never static. So there's always something new. There's always something to be discovered. Um, that just changes our interpretation slightly. Um, even even the smallest things can be changed ever so slightly each year. And we always are trying to stay uh, ahead of all of the best practices in the museum world. Uh, we're an accredited site through the American Alliance of Museums. So that means trying to stay with all of the best practices that museums do today. And. Um, things change and they're changing all the time. So it's never, it's not the same place when I started nine years ago and um, it won't be the same place when I leave. So. Uh, uh, for challenges and if, even if you're running a historic house museum or even if you're trying to do preservation, uh, a biggest challenge for me is is education. Um, it, it, it was very frustrating to work um, on, in the Historic Preservation Commission as a volunteer and having each cycle of Metro Council having to go back and telling them the importance of historic structures to the economy and to, um, to local jobs and, and re-educate every year. It's like the mission of historic preservation would just come in one ear and go out the other. And that was always frustrating to me. And it's still a little frustrating at times because uh, Baton Rouge is one of those places where you're within an hour and a half of Natchez, which has made the whole idea of historic preservation the backbone of their economy. 
and then we're another hour from New Orleans, which thrives on cultural tourism. Um, and here we are not able to understand the benefits that we can gather from that. That was a, a great frustration for me as uh, working in local preservation. The most rewarding part of a, a job in historic preservation is the connections you make with people and that connection that you share and um, whether it be fundraising or educational efforts or outreach or just the, the physical act of trying to save a structure or right, put it into new use in a community is very, very rewarding. It is a um, it's like any common goal. Uh, when you share with a group of folks, it, it, you share with a victory. And it's, it's, that is the most enjoyable part of that programming, um, to be able to be involved in a collective group effort to save a structure. Well, obviously, the, the best way to, to work for historic preservation or even historic uh, public education um, in a history field is to learn what they do and the best way to do that is to start out as volunteering or attending programs and learning what the what they do and any person that shows up to a historic museum or even uh, a preservation commission and wants to volunteer um, they'll they'll soon learn what it means to be a part of it and whether they have the the energy to to vote to that project um, and I think you you will find out whether you have the passion for being a part of that um, that work um, I think that's the most important thing is if you enjoy it and um, if you enjoy it it's something that will always be rewarding for you um, I still have a, a list in my head of everything that I want done at Magnolia Mound before I retire. And so I, I come to work every day thinking, oh, wow, um, it's going to be, I'm going to work on that list. I mean, uh, they're always great things. Um, I, I've yet to become tired of being in this environment. I have a great staff that is dedicated to the mission of education. Um, and we work well together so it's a good group of people to be a part of and so it makes the experience um, very enjoyable as a career and as a workplace so I guess the the thing about the job as executive director of a historic house museum is it is not the job you think it was or at least for what I thought it was my first interests were history, American history, um, then, uh, you know, got specialized to um, antebellum history and in the life of the enslaved and in architecture and then historic preservation. And I enjoyed research and writing and um, giving talks. I still do a little bit of those things, but the role that I have today is not that role. It's, um, it's more of a managing uh, people and volunteers and uh, the facility management of historic structures, which is time consuming, um, uh, lots of documentation, lots of specialized repairs. And it's, I don't often get to write and I often don't get to leave the office to do research. And um, I have to leave those fun jobs to uh, other folks that are on staff. Um, I am envious of people who work in education here at Ma the Mound because they can come up with great ideas and great programming and um, I don't get to do that as much as I used to because um, that's really not the role as a person who's in charge of the, of the building and programming. So um, that I don't get to do anymore. But it is still a uh, um, I guess you evolve in the roles that you have in historic preservation and you, you they do different things at different times. But
Um, well, I'll have to say that I think uh, the most important in, in our area, in, in the metropolitan area of Baton Rouge, I think the most important success story has been Magnolia Mail because it was saved by a grassroots group and also the Recreation and Parks Commission stepped in and bought it through an expropriation battle, which if you know anything about historic preservation, expropriation is it's just so rare. Um, and it was done the same year um, of a landmark case uh, involving um, a, a train station in New York, Grand Central. Um, and, and so in 1966, a local group here stepped in to try to protect Magnolia Mound, which was going to be torn down for an apartment building. And so it involved a larger network, including um, a, a brand new local organization, Foundation for Historical Louisiana, now preserve Louisiana, uh, the Louisiana Trust um, through the uh, Landmark Society um, in New Orleans, and so and then local school children wrote to save the building. So there was this huge group of groundswell people who wanted to be a part of this grassroots efforts to save it, and so it it really took a community effort to save the structure, and then the commitment of the Recreation and Park Commission to buy it once it was taken from the private owner and prevented from being destroyed. So that was a really major community success story and a rare one um, in which you had private property taken from a private owner uh, because um, it was important. And uh, my favorite thing was at the time, uh, Louisiana Constitution, they subsequently revised the Constitution in I think 74 or 75, but the earlier Constitution said it was the duty of every Louisiana citizen to protect its history and culture. And that was written into the existing constitution at the time. So the judge, the local um, judge here in Baton Rouge, who was deciding the case of Magnolia Mound, uh, you cited that and said that the developer who planned to tear Magnolia Mound down was, was, was not adhering to that requirement. And so he took the property at that time. So I think that's a major success story for the state. Um, and, and also I think it led for our, our biggest loss. Um, this was 1966. And within the next, I guess, less than about eight years, um, there was another major battle to save a structure in downtown Baton Rouge that was just unbelievably uh, remarkable and fine. It was the 1925 movie palace that had begun life as the Columbia Theater, and then by 1920, well, about 1930, it had been bought by the Paramount chain. So it was called the Paramount for most uh, uh, Baton Rougeans. It was a faux Greek temple on Third Street, which had all these enormous statues, and it was really incredible. And then you walked in, and it was just uh, it had early a form of air conditioning and early lighting and it had an organ and it was uh, built for talk, uh, for silent movies first and then transitioned to talkies. So it has stage and balconies and mm -hmm. it was really quite an amazing structure and the community tried to save that building and um, it just, it just did not, even though grassroots efforts tried, it just, they could not do it and it was to torn down. And I think that was a major loss for the community that people still um, are smarting over. And it would have been such a landmark for our restored downtown uh, historic district that we have now. Uh, and and it's, it's rare for a large city of our size not to have a great movie palace. And Baton Rouge had at one time four, um, uh, of which the Columbia slash Paramount was the better the the nicer the bigger of them and it's you know the only and it's not there so I, I think that was a big loss also it's kind of interesting because it was built in 1925 and uh, it was only about 50 years old when it was being torn down and I think people had a hard time 50 years was seemed too soon uh, for it they didn't quite appreciate the significance of the of the Paramount Theater um, but it's it's still one of those buildings that people talk about as being should have been still there. It's not. So the pandemic uh, uh, was a, a, 
a real stop in, in normal uh, behavior for everything, including a historic house museum. Um, the first thing I think we noticed was obviously we were closed for about three weeks. We reopened to the staff because um, you need people here in the buildings to observe what's going on. So uh, we started very early coming back and working socially isolated in various buildings. We had six buildings on the property so we could all kind of space out. And that way we were there. Um, programming uh, obviously took a big hit. We didn't do any large public programming. We did a lot of series of virtual programming. Um, we did video tours. Um, we did a lot of maintenance. God, we did a lot of maintenance during the closing time. We cleaned, we organized, we got uh, uh, papers and our archives started in a different direction. Uh, we rewrote our um, emergency preparedness manual. We did all the things that we were on our list to do that we hadn't done and we didn't have the time to. Uh, we had no excuse. Uh, we had uh, no one coming in the front door except the staff. And so we had all the quiet time we could do. Um, and so we worked on a lot of those things and got uh, a good start on um, all of those things that had been sitting around that we wanted to do uh, and hadn't done for a long time. Um, the biggest problem, uh, the biggest uh, disconnect for us is it was the loss of our volunteers. Uh, many of our volunteer pool were in a target age that were most susceptible to the pandemic's uh, worst effects. And so they stayed home, obviously, and we missed that connection with them, having them here for education programs, uh, having their contributions, just having them around. Um, uh, we enjoy a, a healthy relationship with our volunteers. So they are slowly coming back. Uh, they've become, um, they've either had vaccinations or, you know, we've established the protocols that the, the governor's office recommended for museums. So we have small group tours. We're wearing masks when we're inside. Um, and so I think we are slowly adapting to that change. Um, but it was uh, hard to, to keep connected to our staff um, our volunteers and our regular public. And we, the biggest loss with at the during the pandemic for us is being able to connect to the public. And one of the our significant visitor groups were uh, school kids. We saw about three thousand school kids a year, and so we weren't able to to welcome those kids to the property uh, for hands-on uh, living history activities. And so that was a that was hard to be without that. Um, hands-on approach, because that's what we enjoy doing here at Magnolia Mail. Um, so the things that we were, uh, that uh, we use so frequently are um, online resources have increased so incredibly. So we can do so much more from here than we used to be able to do. So we regularly use the resources available through city directories that are online, um, census records, both for free inhabitants and enslaved uh, people. Um, we use uh, online resources available through LSU Special Collections. Um, East Baton Rouge Parish Library has a great digital library of photographs. Um, I'm always plugging into uh, Newsbank, searching the old newspapers of Baton Rouge uh, that are through the EBR uh, Parish Library. So all of those things we used to do physically by going to the library and looking at microfilm, uh, most of which we can access now from here um, by uh, online. Um, there's still things that we like to do go firsthand to the courthouse. There are some records that are not been digitized yet, um, but I tend to use those things pretty frequently um, in developing pr new programming, um, developing, uh, revising old programs. Um, we have a lot of emphasis for school programs that involve kids interpreting primary source materials. So if we have a, a great advertisement of a runaway slave uh, from the EBR paper, that's something that tells a lot about the person um, and that time period uh, that the people could actually use. Um, so those are the resources that we use a lot.